All right. Hi, AP Chem class. This is your uh, lesson for Friday, October 25th. It's day 44. We're going to deal with Graham's law of diffusion, as well as uh, partial pressures and a couple of other topics, as well as some we did earlier in the week. So let's get started with Graham's law. That's one of the new topics for today. So CH4 should be subscript for methane, has a molar mass of 16 grams per mole, and helium has a molar mass of 4 grams per mole. How many times faster will helium effuse? So just one thing you should start off knowing is that the lighter or less massive gas is going to move faster. Effusion is simply the movement of a gas through a small orifice or a hole. Um, and um, diffusion is just the general movement of a gas, say, throughout the room. So uh, e both essentially have to do with how fast gas molecules move and spread out. Now, um, Graham's law is not going to tell you the exact velocity of either of those. It's simply going to tell you how much faster one gas moves than the other. And so the way we're going to do that is we're going to call CH4 gas number one. And we're going to call helium gas number two. And you'd like to write this in a way that the number comes out to be a number greater than one, not a decimal number that's less than one. Um, so what I'm going to do is we're going to say um, that gas um, gas um, two, the ratio of gas two over gas one, how much faster it moves in other words, is equal to the square root of the molar mass of gas one over the molar mass of gas two, and that'll give us a number greater than one. So again, if it's if you want to know the rate of gas two, the lighter gas over the smaller gas, then inside the um, square root sign, you invert that. It's molar mass of one over two. So get that. Be sure you don't get that confused. So the molar mass of um, methane is going to be 16. The molar mass of helium is four. You put that under the square root uh, symbol. 16 divided by four is four and the square root of four is two. So write out, I'd like you to write just a brief sentence what that number means. It means that helium will effuse twice as fast as methane, as CH4. Again, we don't know what the number is, how fast it is, how, how fast the molecules are moving, but that's not what we're trying to find out. We're just trying to find out how much faster the helium will move than the uh, methane. All right, next one. Let's go ahead and move down. So we're going to call, um, uh, which will effuse faster, Cl2 or F2, and how much faster? So we come over here. And we see that fluorine is going to be less massive than chlorine, so it's going to effuse faster. All right, so we'll call fluorine the um, gas two and the chlorine gas one. So gas two, should put actually the word rate of gas two over rate of gas one. And that's going to equal, always write the formula, molar mass of one over molar mass of two. And that's going to give you 70.9, if you figure out the molar mass of chlorine. Remember it's Cl2, it's a diatomic molecule, over 38. And we go ahead and compute that. And that's going to give us 1.37. Let's call 1.4 is good enough. 1.4. So what it's saying is that um, fluorine effuses twice as, or excuse me, 1.4 times as fast as chlorine, CL. Okay. All right, one more of uh, this type of problem, and it's a pretty easy equation to use. So argon 
has got a mass of 39.95, and it is not a diatomic molecule. Remember, noble gases don't like to um, join anybody else, including themselves. So it's 39.95 straight off the periodic table, and Krypton is 83.8. And we're going to call argon our gas two. Again, it doesn't matter which is which, it just matters that you be sure to set up the equation properly. And gas one, so rate of gas two over rate of gas one. Okay, and it's 1.45, 1. Uh, pretty close to the other one, but that's just coincidence, okay? So we have that um, argon effuses 1.45 times as fast, or you could just say faster, doesn't matter, than Krypton. Okay, and that's your, uh, that's your answer there. All right, what's mean free path? So I want you to go to your notes. I've asked you some just basic concept questions, and that is in your notes. It's on page 11. So it's the um, average distance traveled by a particle between collisions. And that's it. So if something is, a, is at high pressure, think about this. If a gas is at high pressure, is it going to have a larger or smaller mean free path than a gas at lower pressure? Well, gas at higher pressure, the molecules, the particles are going to be squeezed together tighter. So they're going to go a shorter distance before they bump into another particle. So at high pressure, the mean free path is smaller. At lower pressure, the mean free path is longer. Okay, next up, this is an equation, uh, right, right the Van der Waals equation. What's the purpose of the Van der Waals equation? It's on the very last page of your notes and it's a pretty um, unfriendly looking equation. And what it does very simply is it corrects for errors in ideal gas law. So gases behave ideally when they're um, when they're at low pressures and high temperatures. That's because at low pressures, they don't bump into each other very often. And at high temperatures, they have a lot of energy. So they don't, the molecules or particles don't want to stick together. We'll talk more about that when we get into intermolecular forces. But as you know, polar molecules want to stick to each other. So if you keep them at high energy, high temperature, it means they don't want to stick together. So they behave more ideally. Um, and at low pressure, they don't bump into each other as often. But uh, not all gases are at high temperatures and low pressures. So what Van der Waals equation does is it corrects for that. So it looks like this. P equals, oops, P plus. And you don't ever have to use this, but you should understand what it's used for. N squared. We're not even going to get into what these things mean. A over v squared and then you're going to multiply that by v minus nb and what n and b and a are are not 
They're important if you want to actually use the equation, but we're not going to get into that, NRT. So notice what you have here. You have P, and then you have V squared. Uh, you have Vs here, so you have Vs. There's your Vs, and then you have NRT. So it's PV equals NRT, but with a lot of stuff added in there. So that's the Van der Waals equation. So write down what it is. Van der Waals equation... Get on screen there, Van der Waals equation corrects for non-ideal gases. And that's all you really need to know about the Van der Waals equation at this point. Okay, so the next question, number six, is write the four statements of kinetic molecular theory. That's on page nine of your notes. So I'm gonna write them, but also give you some explanation of it, okay? So number one is all particles are, constant, are in constant random motion. And what that means is there's no predictable motion. They're not moving in circles. They're not moving always in a straight line. Uh, everything about their motion, uh, everything about their motion is random. And they're always moving. Particle, gas particle never comes to a standstill. Number two, all collisions between particles are perfectly elastic. Okay, so what that means is think of bowling balls. I assume you all know what bowling balls are. When you roll two bowling balls together, what do they do? They just click together and they click away from each other. They don't stick together at all. So what it means is that particles put that in a parenthesis because it's not part of the formal um, statement. Particles are not sticky. They don't stick together. They collide. And separate immediately. Like two bowling balls hitting each other. Okay, that's number two. Number three, the volume of the particles in a gas is negligible. Negligible means effectively nothing. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that they're really, really tiny compared to the space they're occupying. In other words, most of the space in a gas is empty space. It's not gas particles, okay? So they are really small.
compared to the space that they occupy. All right, and number four, you can go ahead and write it up on top if you're running out of space like I am. So number four finally is the average kinetic energy of the molecules is its Kelvin temperature. So there you go. That's your definition of what a Kelvin temperature is. It's the average kinetic energy of the molecules. So Now what's kinetic energy? From physics, it's one half mass times velocity squared. So what does that mean? Well, the mass of the particles doesn't change, okay? They don't get heavier and lighter while they're flying around. They just, they just do, they, their mass is what it is. So that means that the kinetic energy is really a function of the velocity. So, it, so put another way, by, by increasing the temperature, you increase the kinetic energy, and by increasing the kinetic energy, you increase the velocity or the speed of the molecules. So what does that mean? This is really the takeaway from this. Um, higher temperature T for temperature higher temperature gases move faster. That's really what you should think of. When you turn up the temperature, you're making the gas molecules move faster. Okay, and those are the four um, statements of the kinetic molecular theory. What is the formula for the RMS speed of a gas molecule? And you're gonna find that on page 11 of your notes. And in gas, in, gas, uh, in the study of gases, they use U, the scripted U, RMS. Now I told you what RMS stands for in class. I even gave you an, a numeric example of computing RMS. You do not have to know that. What you should simply know is this basically means, it's a basically a way of saying average speed. You can't nor do you need to know the speed of every single gas molecule. You just wanna know the overall average speed of the gas molecules and that's what URMS means it's the average speed and the formula for that is is three r there's the gas constant but there's a catch to that gas constant if you've read the notes I'll give that to you in a sec t over molar mass Now the R used here is in joules and that's because in physics we deal with kilograms, meters and seconds. This is really more physics than it, as much physics as it is chemistry. And so we need an R that has a different unit of measure. So for our class, we can just say it's 8.31. And then um, that takes the place of the 0 0.0821 that we've been using for R before. Let me write that R equals. But on top, instead of latum, instead of liters, atmospheres, it's joules. And you've learned what joules are. They're a unit of measure of energy. Learn that in physics. On the bottom, the denominator is still the same. It's mole, moles, Kelvin. So because of the units of molar mass of temperature, um, you, have to use, you have to adjust your R constant. I could show you the math of how you get from 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres, moles, Kelvin, to 8.31 joules, moles, Kelvin. But it's uh, this is not math class, and you don't need to know that. You just need to know these two different gas constants. Generally, you on any test you will take. You should eventually learn them just by using them so many times that they stick in your brain. 
All right, next, number eight. What of the four gas variables, N, P, V, and T, which have an effect on the speed of the gas? Well, this is the formula for the speed of the gas. And of these four variables here, only temperature appears in the formula. So only the temperature So only the temperature affects the speed of the gas, not pressure, not volume, not number of moles. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a couple. These are just number crunching uh, problems here. And again, I get a little careless with units of measure because um, I know that as long as I plugged in the proper units of measure, the answer, the average speed or velocity is gonna be in meters per second. All right. so. Let's go ahead and so it's telling us it wants to know RMS speed. So it's telling us U RMS is what we're looking for equals question mark. Temperature equals it's in centigrade. That means I need to convert. So right away, as soon as before I write anything else, I just go ahead and do that conversion. 273 plus 25 equals 298K. Okay, what else do I need? I need R. And again, it, write these out every time and they eventually stick in your brain. Joules over Molk. Okay, the other thing I need is I need the molar mass of helium. So I'm gonna write that over here. And that's gonna be four grams per mole. Okay. That's straight off the periodic table. Okay, so now we just plug in the numbers and we'll come up with our answer. Okay, and let's see. Can I get... Okay, and I get about 43.1. So the average speed is 43.1, and don't forget what the units are. Same as they were in physics class, meters per second. All right. There you go, so that's your answer for that. Okay, let's do another. RMS of O2 gas at 87 degrees C. Um, again, try to do these before you just look at the answer. Okay, and the molar mass for oxygen. It's O2 because it's a gas, so it's a diatomic molecule. Oxygens like to stick together when they're in gas form. That's gonna be 32 grams per mole. As long as I know I have my units all correct, I can just plug in the numbers and know that I'm gonna come out with an answer in meters per second.
Okay, and I get 16.7 meters per second for the speed of oxygen at that temperature. Again, if you turned up the temperature, you would increase this, uh, it would increase this number right here. That would make the speed faster. The oxygen molecules or any molecules for that matter would move faster. All right. Now we're going to deal with partial pressures. Partial pressures are really easy. Two things to remember about them. The total pressure in a container is equal to, and by the way, you'll find this in your notes on page, um, on page um, seven and eight. Or actually eight. Um, yeah, page eight, middle of page eight, okay, is equal to the pressures of each of the individual gases. So nature is not always that simple. You can't just add things together a lot of times in nature. Sometimes there's complex relationships um, between, say, pressures or something, but not here. If you know the pressure of gas A, let's say that's nitrogen gas, and the pressure of gas B, let's say that's oxygen, and the pressure of gas C, let's say that's hydrogen, and you put them all in the same container, um, it's simply the total pressure in the container is going to be the summation of those three pressures. There's no uh, strange relationship that goes on where one of them decreases the pressure or increases the pressure of the other. And that's what it also means. They're independent of each other. The other, um, the other thing to understand is that the pressure of a gas is proportional to the number of moles. So if you take a gas and we did this in an earlier assignment and you just find out the relationship between number of moles and pressure with using the ideal gas law, you're going to be at P equals N and assuming that you hold temperature, um, volume, constant, then you're going to get um, P equals N RT over V. That's just the ideal gas law solved for pressure. So if you assume that all three of these things are constant, then if I double the number of moles, I'm going to double the pressure. If I cut the number of moles, that is to say how many particles do I have in the container? If I cut that in half, I'm going to cut the pressure in half. So they're directly very simple, direct relationship between number of moles of gas, how much gas you have in the container, and the pressure. So let's read the question here. Consider a mixture of gas A and B in a closed vessel. Vessel is just a word that means a container of some sort. A quantity of a third gas C is added to the same vessel at the same temperature. How does the addition of gas C affect the following? the partial pressure of A. So again, if we look at this equation, the part, the total pressure is a function of, let's say before gas C is added, let's, let's cover this up. The total pressure is pressure of A plus pressure of B. If we add gas C, we just add a third, a third um, add in there, a number to add in. And so that's the pressure total is A plus B plus C. So did adding this change this number at all? Whatever it was, it was before, it's still the same. If, if for example, this was one mole and this was two moles, and before we added C, it would be one plus two is three. Let's say we added three, three moles of gas C or three atmospheres of gas C, then it would be one plus two plus three. But adding gas C did not change the value of the pressure of A. Um, it did change the total pressure, but it didn't change that. So the answer is, um, adding gas C does not affect any other gas. It does add to the total pressure, but it does not affect any of the other gases. Okay, so no effect is the answer to that one.
Okay, B, how does it affect the total pressure in the vessel? And we just answered that, it adds its pressure. So again, let's just put, make up some pretend numbers. So let's say before we have P total equals pressure of A, it's a pressure, that's a P not an R. Pressure of A, which we say is one atmosphere, plus pressure of B, Let's say that's two atmospheres. Okay, and so the total for that would be P total would be three atmospheres. Now we add a third gas. So the pressure of A is still one atmosphere. Plus the pressure of B is still two atmospheres. And now we're going to add down here, we're going to add pressure of C and that's three atmospheres. So now our total pressure is six atmospheres. It's just a straight up, couldn't be any simpler addition. Okay. So adding another gas. increases total pressure. Okay. Now, what about the mole fraction of gas B? Okay, hmm. What do we know about mole fraction? Didn't tell us anything about moles, but back on the previous page, we found this direct, this direct relationship that whatever, whatever happens to moles happens to pressure or whatever happens to pressure happens to moles. So the mole fraction of gas B is going to be the same as the pressure fraction of gas B. So the pressure of gas B, and how do you get a fraction of one of, of one of how much that one is? You take that over all of the others added together. So it's PA plus PB plus PC. And that equals PB, we said was two atmospheres in our example. By the way, where'd these numbers come from? I just made them up just so I would have an example to work with and to show you. E equals one plus two plus three equals two sixths, which equals one third. So I'm gonna write this over here so you can read it. The, that, now what did I just figure out though? I figured out the pressure fraction. I'm sorry, I didn't write that out. It should be equals one third. There's no unit of measure, by the way, because it's atmospheres over atmospheres. So it's just one third, it's just a number. So the pressure fraction, that is the fraction that B is of all the pressures, equals the mole fraction and that is one third. Okay, so that's the mole fraction. So one third of the moles in that container are, are gas B because one third of the pressure in that container is coming from gas B. All right, next up. A sample of three grams of SO2 transferred to a 10 liter vessel at is is transferred should be is transferred to a 10 liter vessel at 26 degrees centigrade a sample of 2.35 grams of nitrogen gas is transferred to the same 10 liter vessel what is the partial pressure of so2 in the larger container well it came from a smaller container i guess okay so how do we do that um Actually, I didn't leave you space to do this. So um, I'm gonna do this on a separate piece of paper. So 
So let's go ahead and do this one. So it asks you for the A, what is the partial pressure of S2? And then I gave you no space to write that. And then it asks you for N2 and then the total pressure. Okay, so let's go ahead and figure those out. So we want first for part A, this is 12A. It wants the partial pressure of SO2. Okay, what is that? So that's what we want to know. Partial pressure of SO2 equals question mark. What do we have to work with? We have mass. Grams is a measure of mass, so mass equals three grams of SO2. Next, it gives us um, the volume of the container, so V equals 10 liters. And it gives us a temperature, T equals, and immediately, before I even write down that 26, I'm gonna convert it to Kelvin, 273 plus 26 centigrade is gonna equal 299K. Always convert to K in gas laws in particular. All right, so I have VT, um, I have the gas constant. So since we're using, we're back to using PV equals NRT, uh, I'm gonna use this gas constant and it's liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. All right. And finally, uh, that's it. So I have four variables. I'm trying to find pressure. Right here though, I have a mass in grams and I need to convert that to moles because because the, you can't put grams into the ideal gas law or pretty much anything else in chemistry. So go ahead and figure out, I'm just gonna write it over here. The molar mass of SO2 is, go to your periodic table and figure that out. You should know how to do that by now. One mole SO2, S is 32.7 and O2 is 32. So that's going to be 64.07 grams of SO2. Okay, and I'll just go ahead and do my conversion right here. I have the space to do it. So times one mole of SO2 for every 64.07 grams of SO2. All right. And we just do three divided by 64.07, and that gives you 0 0.47. 0 0.047, and that's moles of SO2. Now we have moles that we can use to figure out the partial pressure. So we're gonna say PV equals NRT. Let me just check. I have all my units. I have temperature in Kelvin. I have moles in moles. I have volume in liters. And um, I'm looking for pressure in atmosphere. So I know that's going to give me pressure in atmospheres. So I'm not even going to write down the units of measure. I'm just going to solve this for P. So P equals, you divide both sides by V, N, R, T over V. So there's my transposed equation. So let's go ahead and plug in the numbers. P equals 0 0.047, 0 0.0821 for the gas constant, and the temperature is 299. And down underneath here, we've got the volume, which is 10 liters. Okay, so just go ahead and do the numbers on that, and this is the partial pressure of SO2. And I get 0 0.12. 
and that's going to be atmospheres. Why atmospheres? Because that's what the gas constant is calibrated in for pressures. It's not tors, it's not millimeters of mercury, it's not anything else. So there you go, that's the answer to, the, to that part. Now, 12B is asking the same thing for nitrogen. So let's go ahead and do that one. Go ahead and do it before I do it. See if you can get this one on your own. Okay, and so I'm back, assuming you stopped the video. So here we go, it wants to know partial pressure. of N2 equals something that we're trying to find. Mass equals, and how much mass did it say it gave us? It said it gave us 2.35 grams of nitrogen gas. All right, next is volume. It's in the same container, so it's still 10 liters. Okay, and it's at the same temperature. You know, if, it, if, it's put, if, they're put, if you're putting it in the same container, everything has to be at the same temperature. So T, again, is gonna equal 299 Kelvin. And finally R, and you don't have to write down the constant every time. It's, well, I take that back, you do. I tell you what, I want you to know this. Okay, this thing is just automatic for you when you get on an AP exam. It's that much less you have to fumble around while you're under pressure. Maybe you write it down wrong. You know, you want to go ahead and just know this thing. Latum over mole, leisure atmosphere over mold Kelvin. Now we'll go ahead and do what we did last time. I'm going to say one mole of N2 equals 28.2 grams, 0.02 grams of N2. So I got one mole. Okay, and so we're gonna divide 2.35 by Okay, so we're gonna divide 2.35 divided by 28.02, and that gives you uh, zero, uh, 0 0.08. And that's moles of nitrogen gas. All right, so now that we've got moles, We've got liters, we've got kelvins, we got our gas constant, that's gonna give us our pressure in atmospheres of N2. And so that's gonna be 0 0.08. And that all goes over 10 liters. Again, the temperature and volume being the same. So now we come out with. And it's uh, zero point, call it two one. Okay, and that's the pressure and that's in atmospheres. All right, so we had this number up here for SO2. We have this number down here for N2. So that answers questions A or B, A and B. So 12C is asking us for the total pressure. And again, always write down the formulas so that they just become automatic to you. So P total equals P of SO2 plus P of N2, you add them together, just straight up addition. So that's gonna equal 0 0.12 plus 0 0.21, and that's gonna give you a P total of 0 0.33. 
atmospheres. So there's the total pressure inside the container. Okay, so let's get this like that so you can see the whole thing. And there you go. That's how you do these. All right. Okay, so we're going to wrap up this assignment with a few um, combined gas law um, problems and just to point out some things and how you, you know, how you interpret these problems. So this is the combined gas law that we're going to be using. So a nine liter glass container, stop right there. If it's a glass container, it can't expand or contract. It's got to have the same volume. That means that V1 is going to equal V2. And since they're the same, we don't even have to give them subscripts. We're just going to call them both V. That's the volume of the container. It doesn't change. Okay. Holds oxygen gas at 734 torr. So first of all, we're going to put down, I'll put it over here, pressure equals, and it's P1. Because remember, these are before and after problems. The, all the ones are the before conditions. All the twos are the after conditions. 734 torr. Now, what is torr a measure of? It's a measure of pressure. So the question you might ask after having done some of these previous problems, do you have to convert that to atmospheres? The answer is no, because you're not dealing with the gas constant, which has to, which is calibrated in atmospheres. So you have to be sure your pressure in an ideal gas law equation is in atmospheres. But this is not, this does not involve um, the ideal gas law. It does not involve the gas constant R. So you don't have to convert to, at, to uh, atmospheres in this, okay? So there's P1, T1, this is the temperature before. Right away we're going to convert, it's 273 plus 28 degrees C, that equals 301K. Okay, and then the temperature is increased to 38 C, so that's going to be T2, that's an after, after you've made some change, that's what after means, is 273 plus 38, and that's going to equal 311K. What is the new pressure? So we're trying to find out P2. The new pressure means the pressure after the change equals question mark, okay? So, and we determine that V1 equals V2 equals V. So first thing I want you to do is learn to do your algebra. If this is not your strong point, P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. And so it's what we're looking for is P2. We're trying to isolate this variable right here, the P2 right there. Want to get that by itself. That means we need to get rid of V2 and T2. Since it's all multiplications and divisions, you just do the appropriate operation to reverse it. So this is a, on the top, so you put it on the bottom, there's V2, and they cancel. But anything you do to one side, you have to do to the other. So I'm going to put V2 right there on the bottom of the other side. Now we have P2 over T2, we need to get rid of T2. So we're going to put it up on the top, T2. So those cancel. So that means we have to put it over here. So the numbers we're going to plug in are T2, P1, V1 on the top. Those are all being multiplied together. And T1, V2 on the bottom, those are all being, those are dividing, the numbers on the top are being divided by those two numbers. So let's just go ahead and plug them in. So T2, we said, is 311. We don't have to put units since we know all of our units are the same, are appropriate. Um, P1 is 734. and V1. V1 we said is equal to V2, which is just V. So we don't know a number for it, but we're just gonna put it in there as V. And that's gonna be over T1, which is 301, times V2. And again, V2 is the same as just V. So you notice what happens here, the V cancels with the V right away before we even have to do any math. And that's gonna equal P2. So just go ahead and run the numbers on that.
and that gives us 758.4 and we'll just put that down 758.4 now what are the units of measure for the pressure it's whatever you were given in the problem you don't all of a sudden change it to atmospheres okay or anything else you're given tor so your final answer is in tor if it asks you to convert to something else and do that but that's a separate problem okay there you go all right that's how you do that let's move on to the next one okay a balloon so bam right away it's a balloon balloons you can blow up a balloon you can deflate a balloon that means the volume is not going to be constant okay so a balloon with an initial volume of 28 l so i'm going to start over here v1 equals 28 liters and liters is the unit we want to work with so we don't need to convert undergoes an increase in temperature from 34 degrees centigrade so that's our first temperature that's our beginning temperature t1 equals 273 plus 34 and that's going to be 307 okay from 34 to 59, so T2, that's the after conditions, after you've made a change, is 273. And that's gonna get us up to 332. Okay, good. And now we have pressures to deal with. There's two pressures. So the pressure increase from, that's going to be the, the initial pressure, P1, before the change. And P2, I'm just writing it wherever I have space here. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five variables. It wants to know the new volume, so that's V2. And usually you identify that first, but I just went in the order as it was written in the problem. That equals question mark. Okay, so we've got P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. All right, so we're looking for V2, so we've got to do our algebra here. So I'm just going to do it right here since I'm a little short on space. Um, I'm trying to get this by itself, this guy right here. So I need to divide both sides by P2. And that cancels with that. And I have P2 over here somewhere on the bottom. And I, need to, I have T2, I need to put it up on top. That cancels with that. That means it needs to go on the top over here somewhere. It doesn't matter what order. They're all being multiplied. You can multiply in any order. So that's going to equal T2. T2 is 332. P1. P1 is 104.3. Just a lot of numbers, but not a really hard problem. And V1. V1 is 28 liters. Down on the bottom, we have P2, that's 107.9. And T1, which is 307. So now we multiply, since it's volume, we know our answer is gonna be in liters. That's why we can be a little careless with the units of measure, as long as we know we've, we've started off with the appropriate units. All right, so go ahead and just calculate that. 332 times 104.3 times 28 liters divided by 107.9 divided by 307. And we get 29.3. So the balloon went up a little bit. Its pressure went up a little. Its temperature went up a little. So its volume went up a little. It goes up to 29.3 liters in size it gets a little bit bigger and that's that all right one last problem here a glass container holds co2 gas at a temperature of 85 c 104 atmosphere the temperature is increased to 142 c what's the new pressure so we're looking for p2 the pressure after it's a glass container so v1 equals V2 equals V. All right, uh, CO2 gas, 85 degrees um, 
is the beginning temperature. So T1 equals 273 plus 85, and that equals 358K. Okay, the T2 is right here. We'll jump over to that. T2 is 142, so 273 plus 142. So that's gonna take us up to what, 413, 415? I just wanna be sure, I don't wanna guess. And 415K. And finally, you had a pressure, a beginning pressure before anything was changed. That's P2 equals 104 atmospheres, 1.04 atmospheres. All right, so we've got five variables and one unknown. So P1, V1 over T1. Okay, so just like a couple problems back, we're trying to get P1 by itself. So that means we're gonna divide by V2 and make those cancel. That means we have to divide this side by V2. And then we're gonna multiply up top by T2. So these two cancel. That means we gotta put a T2 up here. Yeah. Okay, and that's gonna give us our new pressure. So plug in the numbers. So T2 is 415. P1. And I missed, made a mistake that that should be P1. We're trying to find P2. Get on screen here. I had written that as P2. It should be P1. That's, that's our initial um, pressure. Okay, so it's 1.04 times V1 is just V. It doesn't give us a volume, but we know it's the same before and after. So we're just gonna call that V. On the bottom, we have T1. So that's gonna be 358. And V2, and again, the volume didn't change, so we're just calling it V. So right away, those two cancel out. And we can just compute that P2 is gonna equal whatever is left over there. And it's 1.2. And what's the unit? Because there's a lot of different units for pressure and we can use any of them as long as we're not dealing with the gas constant, which requires that we have it in atmospheres. So we come up here, oh, there's our pressure right there in atmospheres. So the final pressure is gonna be in atmospheres. Whatever your initial pressure was in will be your final pressure. All right, so that's it. Uh, so um, this is going to just be practice, practice, practice. We're going to move on from gas laws, but that doesn't mean we're going to stop practicing. You'll constantly be given new assignments. Uh, I am going to ask that you watch the videos if you're struggling with this. Um, and uh, they're really gas laws are not are not that difficult. Just take a little bit of practice. So we'll uh, see you in class. By the way, I am going to put up a copy. I'm going to read the notes. Probably be about an hour to do that. Maybe even a lot less than that. I'm not sure. And I'm going to post that. So if you want to watch a video of me reading and explaining the, the gas notes, they will be up under all of this week's assignments on all five days. Um, you can see them there. All right. Have a nice day and we'll uh, see you on Monday in class.